Okay, so welcome along, ladies and gentlemen, to your weekly SETI, SETI seminar series. Today we're uh, very lucky to be joined by Peter Yeniskins. He's a PI here at the SETI Institute. And uh, Peter uh, uh, did his PhD topic on uh, diffuse interstellar bands with Xavier Desir, and uh, then did a postdoc uh, here at NASA Ames with David Blake on uh, uh, looking at a viscous form of uh, liquid water, which is uh, uh, thought to be present on comets and uh, other objects in the solar system. Peter is uh, the author of the book uh, Meteor Showers and Their Apparent Comets. Uh, he's also the current president of Commission 22 at the IAU. Uh, and uh, he, uh, there, uh, the uh, asteroid uh, 42981 uh, Yeniskins is uh, named after Peter. Um, he is uh, well known in um, uh, in the Meteorite Falls community for his work uh, leading the team to collect TC, TC3 fragments uh, with uh, members of the uh, team at University of Khartoum. He was then uh, involved in the Sutter's Hill Fall, uh, collecting, uh, c collecting fragments from that meteorite. Uh, and uh, soon after the Chelyabinsk Fall, he, uh, he was uh, part of a team uh, that uh, investigated and published their results uh, on that, um, and that was the subject of a previous talk uh, that you can find on our website. And he is also the PI of the CAMS uh, Instrument Array, which is uh, looking for uh, meteorite falls uh, over California. Uh, and today he's going to talk to us about the recent uh, Comet Sighting Springs encounter with Mars and uh, other encounters that we can look forward to in the future. So please join me in welcoming Peter. Thank you all for uh, attending this, uh, se this seminar. Um, Siding Spring at Mars. Siding Spring is the name of a comet. It is not uh, an idea to um, transplant a place in Australia to uh, the planet of Mars. Uh, the comet was uh, discovered in the Siding Springs survey, that's why the name. Uh, it um, was a comet that was uh, exceptional, uh, in, in mainly because it passed really close to Mars, as in incredibly close. And uh, this close passage has just happened about eight days ago. Uh, so uh, it, is, uh, it is still uh, very early. Uh, point in time uh, to talk about the results from this encounter, as I'll explain later. Uh, 29P Linear is the name of another comet uh, that appeared earlier this year in, uh, uh, in May and passed close to the Earth, and also exceptionally close, although not quite as close as uh, Comet Siding Spring. Uh, the cool thing about it is that uh, these are two very different comets. And uh, the stories that, uh, that came from these close encounters are, are very different, and they're both uh, ex extremely interesting. So again, my disclaimer is that we are only eight days from this close encounter with Siding Springs. Uh, satellite operators are still downloading the data. Uh, a few of the results have been uh, made public, and I'll, t I'll tell you what has come out so far. Uh, but uh, we'll, we'll need a yeah. month or two uh, for the teams to get their act together and really understand what it was that they were, they were looking at. And um, I'm organizing a special session on the uh, Siding Springs at the HU4 meeting here in San Francisco, uh, together with Diane Wooden of NASA Ames and uh, Pat Van Tollis. And I think that uh, this would be a great uh, opportunity, uh, if you have an opportunity to uh, attend the HU, to listen to the, the actual instrument operators and hear what, uh, hear, hear what they really, uh, really saw. So this is Comet Siding Spring. Uh, it is an Oort cloud comet. So this comet just spent, you know, a couple of million years to come from the outer regions of the solar system in what we call the Oort cloud. It's a sort of a spherical distribution of comets surrounding our solar system to travel all the way into the, um, to the inner part of the solar system. That's what we call a new comet. Uh, it, uh, it probably did not make an earlier passage, at least not one that we can trace back. Um, these uh, new comets are, uh, are cool because they, they probe all these comets that are in the Oort cloud. And the origin of the Oort cloud is a very interesting science question. So people think they may have been leftovers from the formation of the solar system, but there are alternative ideas that they may be uh, accumulated from other star 
systems that formed in the same birth cloud as the sun. So the Oort cloud comets could be a completely different beast than the comets that come from the Kuiper belt, from the, from the region uh, that is sort of the extension of our solar disk. So Oort cloud comets are really interesting. A uh, good example of an Oort cloud comet is Hill Bob. And that immediately tells you that these comets can get to be very big. <laughs> and when this comet was first discovered by uh, Bob McNaught, uh, it, was, uh, it was at a distance of 7.2 astronomical units from the sun, which is incredibly far away. <laughs> so it's, it's really cool that this comet was seen coming in so, uh, so far out. Uh, it was in the southern hemisphere, d deep in the southern hemisphere. Uh, when the comet was first discovered, uh, uh, it was deep on the southern hemisphere by uh, Bob McNaught uh, at Siding Spring uh, Observatory. Uh, at the time, the first estimates were that this thing was somewhere between 8 and 50 kilometers in size. <laughs> Huge. <laughs> and uh, that immediately uh, raised some concerns because it was very quickly discovered that this comet was uh, going to pass by the planet Mars very, very closely to the point that initially, you know, it looked like it could hit. Now, with the current size estimates, since that time, the size has gone down from, you know, 25 kilometers down to 0.8 kilometers. So we now think that this thing was only about 800 meters in size. But even with 800 meters, if this thing would have hit Mars, uh, we just calculated that uh, the impact energy would have been 52,000 megatons. 52,000 megatons. And that is because uh, these Oort cloud comets come in, uh, you know, steep angle uh, with, uh, from, from very far in the solar system. Uh, relative high speed to Mars uh, in sort of a, uh, a collision, a, a, a head-on uh, type of a collision geometry. And the result is that uh, they are impacting at uh, 57 kilometers per second. So we're talking Perse Perseid shower speed. <laughs> so uh, so this, is a, this was a, a, you know, a, a very interesting uh, discovery. Now, uh, immediately, uh, lots of things happened that sort of uh, spelled the doom. Uh, just 10 days later, uh, Bob McNaught's house was burned down <laughs> to the ground <laughs> by a bush fire that swept through the area. Um, it uh, d damaged uh, a lot of the guest housing at Siding Spring Observatory. Most of the telescopes uh, avoided uh, being destroyed. But uh, as Bob was describing in this wonderful story in Sky and Telescope, uh, that he, he and his wife escaped with uh, our dogs and our lives, but not much else. And so, uh, uh, it, as I said, it was immediately recognized that uh, this comet, uh, on the 19th of October in 2014, so that was a year and a half ahead, uh, was going to come very close to Mars. This is a picture taken uh, uh, a, a, a day or two out. You can see there that uh, Mars is, tra is traveling, the comet is traveling relative to the star background, and uh, they were, uh, were set for a close encounter. And how close of an encounter? Well, this is where, what ultimately things settled down on. This comet was going to pass Mars at a distance of 130,000 kilometers. That is, doesn't say a lot, but it's 20 times the diameter of Mars. It's uh, 16 times closer than any comet we know of that passed by the Earth. So the, close, the comet that came closest to the Earth was Comet Lexel in 1770. This time came 16 times closer to Mars than that comet came to Earth. And uh, Ye and we said it was a one in a 100,000 year occur, uh, occurrence. Of course, that was, uh, I assume, based on the larger diameter of the object early on. So maybe it ha actually happens a little more often. But this was clearly something else. And uh, immediately, uh, people started looking into um, what um, uh, could this mean? In, uh, OK, the comet is not going to hit Mars, but what could this mean in terms of meteoroids hitting Mars? Because comets are the source of our meteor showers. They, they let go of all this debris. The debris tra uh, is, is ejected with a certain speed and then travels a certain distance away from the comet nucleus. And um, uh, in doing so, uh, it could actually uh, arrive at Mars, and it could hit the atmosphere. And in the early calculations that were done, uh, still thinking that this comet was, you know, 25 kilometers in size, <laughs> um, a number of uh, meteor astronomers uh, raised the uh, alarm because uh, it was very clear that uh, if this would hold up, uh, this comet was going to create a meteor shower with a zenith hourly rate of, and I'm reading here, 4.75 
times 10, uh, times 10 to the 9, 4.75 times 10 to the 9. In other words, a zenith hourly rate of uh, around 5 billion. <laughs> and to give you context, the, the Perseids have a zenith, a maximum zenith hourly rate of 80. <laughs> so you're talking, uh, you know, uh, really an incredible shower to, to watch. And the uh, impact speed would be 57.4 kilometers per second. You know, you're talking really Perseid-like uh, meteors on the sky. Uh, and this was uh, just uh, Jeremy's uh, Fourbillon's depiction on how Mars would be engulfed in the, in the meteoroids if this, if this scenario would really be true. And of course, then you immediately start worrying about all those Martians. <laughs> um, many of us uh, really wanted to travel to Mars and be there and s set up in a reclining lawn chair and really <laughs> enjoy the show. <laughs> um, Others are still trying to do that, so I, I encourage maybe get another opportunity in the future to see meteor showers on Mars. That would be very cool. Um, in this case, uh, the, the, the worry mainly went to the satellites in orbit. So, so Mars, ESA, and uh, the Indian Space Agency also were uh, going to have s satellites in orbit there. And uh, if the impact rates were as high as uh, uh, Jeremy and others predicted early on, then that would mean that, that there was a significant chance that these satellites would be hit by meteoroids. And if they get hit by meteoroids, then they create a little plasma cloud. And the plasma cloud can penetrate into your e electronics, and you can lose the satellite. And so, uh, so they, uh, they, uh, they initially took this very seriously. And a lot of uh, studies were done to um, uh, on, on, on what can we do. And of course, the thing to do is uh, to, to take your solar panels, which is your biggest surface area, and, uh, and phase this, do this edge on to the stream. So that's an easy solution. And the other thing you can do is you can uh, set yourself up behind the planet if you can. So this is the view from the, this is the, view from the comet. But you, if you're on the other side of the orbit, you can make sure that your uh, satellite is there. Now, that only works for a short period of time. So you can't do that during the whole stream. But, that, but it helps uh, minimize your impact danger. So that was the sort, sort of scenarios people were talking about. In the meantime, uh, we had a prelude. And uh, that happened in May of this year. Uh, a comet uh, called 29P Linear uh, uh, was um, coming very close to the Earth. 29P Linear is not an Oort cloud comet. It's a comet. It's a comet from the Kuiper Belt, originated in the Kuiper Belt. Uh, in the Kuiper Belt, it got disturbed. It came into the, uh, um, among Saturn, uh, Uranus, and Neptune, the bigger planets. It was gradually um, brought in to the inner solar system. At some point, it was captured by Jupiter. And then it ended up in a short, about five-year orbit, uh, going uh, mostly inside the orbit of Jupiter. It's actually in a fairly stable orbit. Uh, so it, so suggesting that this has been there for a while. Now, when this thing was first discovered, back in 2004, it looked like an asteroid. There was no activity. But uh, sure enough, it was Bob McNaught at Sidex Spring <laughs> that discovered uh, about a month, two months later, that uh, this thing was actually a comet. It was actually uh, uh, having some outgassing. And uh, at the time, uh, I was investigating all the various comets we knew of that came close to the Earth. And this one was uh, scheduled to make a very close passage by the Earth. On May 29 of 2014, this comet was uh, set to go and pass by 0.05 AU from the Earth. Now that's, um, uh, that's you know, uh, about 20 lunar distances. So it's, it's, a, it's a lot uh, further away. The, the, the comet at Mars was at one third of a lunar distance. <laughs> so this thing, you know, it was a prelude. It was not a real uh, a main act, but uh, it sort of, uh, it gave us a, a real close look at uh, one of these uh, comets. Now, what I thought was really cool about it was that uh, this was a weakly active comet, a weakly active Jupiter family type comet. And so normally, when people study comets, they want to look at active ones, things where something goes on, where there's activity, where there's a lot of stuff going on. This one is not. This one is normally looks like an asteroid, only when it's very close to perihelion, then there is some activity. But it is these comets that are giving us a lot of our meteor showers. It turns out that a lot of the objects that the NEAD object surveys are now discovering um, in sort of Jupiter family comet orbits that are asteroidal looking turn out to be able to associate it with, with our meteor showers. So these objects may not be oozing out a lot of debris, 
but periodically they fall apart. They, cr they shed a lot of uh, dust. And uh, that dust evolves and then gives us our meteor showers. So that, what, uh, that was what made this object very interesting to me. And uh, in, uh, back in 2004, we did not know about a meteor shower associated with this object. None. So there was no activity associated with it. But the close passage of the comet uh, made it possible that uh, something might happen. And so we made a prediction and worked with Escolitinen back in 2004 that uh, you know people should pay attention that this is a very interesting case um, the dust that, that was going to be impacting the earth was old debris so the the most free recently ejected uh, dust trails were not in the earth's path but if you if you went back in the 18th 19th early 20th century then the, the dust trails if the comet was active in those days the dust trails would be in the earth's path and we might be able to see a nice meteor shower now you can hear there's a lot of ifs there <laughs> Was the comet active in those days? We don't know. Um, you know. So uh, what what happens to the dust between uh, now and between when it was ejected a few centuries ago and now? That was actually the most interesting question that that uh, could be answered. Uh, but this was was clearly an interesting case, and so uh, uh, we were very excited about it. Uh, we had an opportunity to uh, measure the freshly ejected comet dust of a weakly active comet. Now, this was not going to be a big uh, comet event because the comet was only magnitude 12, so it was pretty hard to observe at the peak, it, despite it coming very close. Uh, but it was a great meteor shower event. And uh, we organized a small multi instrument aircraft campaign where uh, we chartered a small aircraft here out of Palo Alto and uh, that could take us up into the sky. And this was a little exercise we did for a project we want to do in the future, where we rapidly respond to uh, an asteroid sighting. We want to I want to be at the location where an asteroid comes in and observe the, the asteroid impact. Uh, this, this event came together a, a day and a half before the shower. Suddenly, we heard the news from the director at the Institute that said, pack your bags, <laughs> you're going to have this mission. And so very quickly, uh, Ron Dantowitz, that I collaborated with on this project to, to chase the asteroid, uh, traveled from, uh, from Brooklyn in Massachusetts to, uh, to SETI Institute. We had our cameras ready uh, to go. And uh, we, we quickly organized the logistics of flying the aircraft, setting up a, a, a flight path, and uh, figured out how to set up our cameras in the aircraft. So we set up uh, intensified cameras on the main cabin uh, windows and uh, Ron was set up in the back with his uh, uh, spectrographic cameras. And uh, we got to fly, and we got to do the mission, <laughs> and it was very exciting. Uh, again, we had no clue what to expect, you know, there may be no activity at all, or there may be. And I'm telling you, when we were up in the air and when we saw the first meteors from the shower, just a few, that was an incredible experience. <laughs> Because suddenly they knew that, hey, there was a new meteor shower in the sky. Something that had not been seen before was, was there. We were actually probing the dust of a weakly active comet. And this is the, these are the meteors we picked up. We, we saw 21 comely parallels from the plane. And this is how they were distributed. And we were, we were out there at, um, at during the, the period, it was a short flight, uh, during the period when um, uh, the, the Earth was crossing these various dust trails. So the, the very old ones were crossed first, and then sort of the ones in the, in the 19th century, and then the ones in the early 20th century. And most activity came from the ones in the early 20th century. So what we were seeing was the dust that was most recently uh, ejected. And uh, what we uh, uh, didn't immediately realize, but that came out in the, in the analysis later, was that uh, the meteors we were seeing were faint. There were, f were a few bright ones, but very few. And if you actually looked at the distribution of the meteoroids, then this particular shower was heavily skewed to the faint meteors. So if you went out and you didn't see anything, <laughs> you know, despite uh, all the optimism that uh, pervaded in the media, uh, then uh, this was the reason. Uh, this turned out to be a really cool shower for uh, people with radars. <laughs> and uh, all people flying in a plane and having a good view on the on the sky. But it was not that easy an ob uh, a shower to see with the naked eye. But if you saw one of these meteors, anybody did? Can I get a hand of raise? Who saw, who saw a Camellia Parlet last May? No? I don't think it was. <laughs> I saw one, but I don't think it was a Camelot. Yeah. It was just outside. 
if you saw one, then you saw something very unique. You know, nobody else ever saw this meteor. <laughs> and so uh, it's very cool to see this debris from this comet, 29P linear, actually hit the Earth. And so we, we got to see that. And so uh, we're also running a, a ground-based uh, network here in the Bay Area where we uh, film the night sky every night from three locations here at Lake Observatory at Fremont Peak and in uh, and Sunnyvale. And we uh, triangulate the trajectories and we are determining from what direction the meteors are coming to us. And this is a graph that shows uh, that, um, that showed that distribution of meteors in the sky. Uh, this is uh, um, just a few weeks in the, in the early uh, December period. And you can see the, the various showers that are active in December. You can see the Geminids and the Taurids and November Orionids and December Monocertids and some other showers you've never heard of. There are a lot of showers in the sky. And all these showers are a record of one of these comets being active in the past. So they all tell a, tell a bit of the history and a bit about the properties and the orbit and orbital evolution of uh, the near Earth objects, the comets that are coming close to the Earth. Is that so scatter real? And the scatter is real, yeah. The scatter is the result of uh, planetary perturbations where uh, the meteoroid orbits are slightly changed over time. Uh, the position of our instrument is, uh, is really good. Uh, the, the orbit that is most compact, that blue, that blue shower there uh, near Cassiopeia, uh, we think that that might be dust from Comet 3 Bela, uh, associated with Andromeda storms in the 19th century. So that, could actually, that was actually a shower that only showed up in one year and not in others. Uh, and that, uh, that, sort of the, that sort of shows the position of our equipment. We're actually very, very, we are very compact uh, with our radiance. And how compact? Well, here is uh, you know, the results from the Cam Leopard uh, These are the, the meteor radiance we measured, and you can see that uh, we are we are just a, you know, a degree, two degrees uh, scatter in our orbital elements. Uh, this was freshly ejected dust. This was really a new shower in the sky <laughs> for uh, just a few hours. Uh, this is the detection by radar with the Seymour radar. You can see there was quite a strong detection compared to everything else going on. This was really uh, a shower that was rich in, in, for in faint meteors. Um, the uh, activity of larger particles was a factor of 20 less than the, uh, the earlier estimates. 20 less. Now, the earlier estimates were based on you know, a certain expected level of activity of the comma. So you, you take the, the comet activity as, as it's observed, and then you make a guess on, on what the activity is going to be. So this was a factor of 20 less. Now, why is that? Uh, something could be wrong in the, in the uh, the modeling, the approach on uh, how to translate from uh, seeing the activity of the comet to uh, ca calculating how many dust particles you expect. Uh, but it could also be that what we are seeing here is a effect of fading. We are basically seeing that these meteoroids, and that's what I think is going on, that these meteoroids in space are not uh, liking the space environment, whether that's the heating and cooling in daylight or uh, spinning up or cosmic rays or whatever it is. The meteoroids do not survive uh, uh, indefinitely when they are in the interplanetary medium. And from the observed activity from our 19th century dust trails compared to uh, what we expected it to be, it looks like that the Cameliopardalite dust was falling apart into smaller debris on a time scale of 50 years. So it's really rapidly fading. And we're seeing similar effects with other meteor showers, with the Leonids. We're seeing the fading happen on a time scale of about 300 years. So the Leonid uh, dust trails, the older dust trails that we expect from the Leonid showers uh, are not there anymore. The, the dust rate goes down and they disappear. So, uh, so there is a, there is a, a, a fading, a, a, a gradual decay of the meteoroids going on. And I think that that happens on a much bigger scale with, the, with all the freshly ejected meteoroids in the inner solar system. So this is a very cool, uh, uh, cool result. And uh, you can see that uh, the, the sort of the, the proneness of uh, breaking apart uh, in how the meteoroids came into an, our Earth's atmosphere. These are just, uh, this is some video from the plane uh, where one bright meteor was seen uh, coming in. And you can see that it, it, it makes a strong wake at the end. And that wake is little dust particles that are shedding off. And uh, there's a wonderful video that was made by uh, Peter Slansky in Germany, where he had one of these Kamele particles. And you see that uh, also the same way very, very nicely towards the end. 
this, uh, what was a point of light becomes this long slew. And that's because uh, when the meteoroid penetrates the other atmosphere, the collisions of the uh, air molecules with the meteoroid make it, make it break and go into a, into a cloud of dust. And so this is, uh, this is an interesting property. And so uh, thinking about uh, comet um, siding spring, uh, you know, uh, thinking about the possibility that there's meteors on Mars, uh, how interesting would it be to see the freshly ejected meteoroids from this comet interact with the Martian atmosphere and actually be able to probe this really freshly ejected of the large dust grains, the stuff that you cannot see with, uh, with remote sensing, to, to see those uh, meteoroids fall apart. This, uh, this is Comet 29P linear, as it was seen by radar at Arecibo. Uh, this was the best observed comet nucleus yet uh, that Arecibo got to look at. Uh, the images that came back were quite uh, spectacular in my view. You know, you'd, uh, it's not uh, uh, it's the next picture I'll show you with the, uh, uh, going there with a the lander, but, uh, but it shows a lot of detail. And it shows a very ragged, very uh, uneven type of a landscape. And that was very interesting to see. Um, and then, of course, uh, we all know uh, about this comet, <laughs> Comet uh, uh, Shoyumov uh, Gerasimenko, um, a comet that uh, uh, turned out to be a wonderful surprise in the way the shape was and the way the, the, the topography was. Uh, this, is the, this is now being visited by the Rosetta spacecraft. Um, which uh, uh, plans to go and put a lander on it and uh, plans to follow this comet on its path uh, 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 around the sun. So uh, going through perihelion, actually watching how the comet's activity turns on and uh, how that activity changes. And uh, uh, this is also a Jupiter family type of comet. So this is uh, like a, a comet linear uh, in its origins. Uh, and maybe uh, in its you know, rough top topography, uh, it, it has some similarities with it as well. So it's going to be very interesting um, to see how this comet behaves and then to see if uh, understanding how this comet behaves, we can better understand what happens to comet uh, 29P linear. And this is uh, just one of the images that uh, was recently released uh, from this comet. Uh, you can see that uh, activity has now started. And uh, the activity, interestingly enough, is coming from the neck of the comet. Now, uh, there are two talks dedicated to this topic coming up in December here at SETI. So please come and uh, listen to the people who study these objects, and they will tell you all about it. Uh, this is, to me, is fascinating because 20 years ago, we would never have thought that this was possible, that this is how a comet would look like. you know. So uh, our, uh, our ideas, our image, our uh, understanding of comets has, has incredibly evolved. Now, what's important for understanding you know, what you're going to see on Mars from Comet Siding Spring is to understand how fast these meteoroids are ejected from the comets. So it's, it's basically what you're seeing here in this pro process. Uh, Rosetta is... Um, is, is advertised as a, as, a, as a comet mission, but of course it really is a mission to study how meteoroid streams are formed. <laughs> and so we will get a wonderful uh, view of it. And, uh, and what part of that uh, effort is to understand how, with what sort of speed are these meteoroids ejected. So the idea is that gas, be it CO2 gas or water uh, vapor, uh, drags the dust particles away from the nucleus while the gas flows away in this sort of scenario. And that, in the end, um, puts the particles at a relative speed to the comet. And that speed is of the order of uh, a few tens of meters per second if you have a, a siding springs comet under these conditions, and if the particles are small enough. And then, of course, the speed of the particles depends on how big your particle is. Your really small particle is easy to uh, uh, accelerate, but, it's, but a big particle is, is harder to move, and so that will be slower. So in the end, the big particles will hang very close to the comet nucleus. They will sort of travel along with the comet, while the small particles will, uh, will form a much wider coma. And it's the small particles that scatter dust. So those are the ones that you see as a, as a comet dust uh, coma, dust tail. So then uh, the question the, the modelers had was, OK, we have some sense on um, what the ejection speeds of comets is. Uh, that's the sort of equation people are using. But um, 
depending on the, the, the certain c the conditions of ejection on the comet, this can go, you know, can be a little bit more, can be a little bit less. And uh, if it's a little bit more, then that has dramatic consequences for uh, how w big of a dust cloud you're going to create. And so people uh, investigated this. There were three different teams now that uh, were on top of this problem. They were all uh, 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 calculating how did this dust would evolve and, and where it would be relative to Mars. And these are the general pictures that they came up with. Um, the, dust, the dust being shown to just glance Mars. So if this uh, scenario is correct, then uh, the, dust, the Mars just escaped being, uh, being hit by the meteorites in this sense. So from uh, having a hurricane on Mars that uh, could all wipe out all the satellites that are in orbit at that time, uh, the, the whole uh, story evolved into um, no, you're safe, just far enough away, you're, you're well enough, so maybe it's a good time to go and observe this comet, you know, use the satellites as a way to, uh, to do a comet mission. It's just like Rosetta, except, you know, you're not quite as close to the nucleus, but, but, but look at it from a distance. And uh, uh, this, by the way, is a, uh, just a summary on how the, um, the, the fluence measurements, the estimates on how much uh, dust you're actually going to be hitting satellites uh, evolved over time. So the initial estimates were very high, but it, those were based on, you know, a big comet. And then the comet itself became smaller and smaller. And so now it's, you know, about 800 meters or so. And uh, with that, the, the dust fluence went dramatically down because when the cloud gets to be smaller than, you know, you reach Mars, then you don't see any dust. And so we can have, uh, we can have uh, a comet linear come close to the Earth, and still there can be no meteor shower. The dynamics has to work out so that the dust is in the Earth's part right at the time when Earth is there for us to see it. And so uh, then it depends, of course, on the relative ejection velocity. So if the, if the speeds are higher than what people think, then you, know, you start having, having chances of particles again. So this was sort of the, the discussion. And this was the view from the comet at Mars. Uh, you can see that uh, you know, the comet is, uh, is on your uh, left-hand side, uh, passing on the left-hand side of Mars. Um, it uh, sadly meant that the uh, Opportunity rover was facing uh, the comet at closest approach, but it would be on a daylight side of, of the planet. So the best time for the Opportunity rover to see the meteors would be in the hours before uh, dawn. And watching before dawn, if you ever went out meteor uh, observing, you know that the two hours before dawn on Earth are the best hours to go out and see meteors. And th it's the same on Mars. So, uh, so that's, uh, that's still you know, my hope that uh, maybe the first meteors on Mars were detected. Ma even, even if these meteors are not from the comet itself, it would be very, very cool to, to, uh, to detect those. And, uh, and you can see the situation with the satellites. Uh, the Curiosity rover, unfortunately, was on the other side of Mars. So they couldn't see it at all. And uh, they, uh, they, of course, were in a good position to see the comet in the sky because they would be in the nighttime circumstances during the clo close encounter. Um, and, so the, and then, of course, there's the various satellites uh, that are going around that, uh, that uh, go around fairly quickly so they get this whole uh, sort of picture to look at. Uh, meteors on Mars, uh, just real quick, uh, would, if they come in, uh, you would think that the meteors on Mars, because the atmosphere is a lot less dense, uh, would, would penetrate a lot deeper. But the Martian atmosphere uh, has a very gradual pressure gradient. And so it turns out that, that uh, most meteors on Mars, uh, on, on the Earth, are sort of between uh, 80 and 90 kilometers. Uh, the meteors on, uh, on Mars would be more between uh, 50 and 70 kilometers. So they would still be uh, as high up in the atmosphere. So the, the, s the circumstances of for observing them, you know, uh, how you would view meteors on Mars, would be very similar. You know, I would still take my reclining lawn chair, <laughs> my pen, and, and, and enjoy the view. The atmosphere, uh, uh, in that sense, uh, is, uh, is p good protection for all that fast stuff coming in. Uh, this is a picture that was taken by the Mars Orbiter missions. So very, very uh, coincidentally, uh, the Mars Orbiter mission and Maven uh, would be uh, entering the, Ur Urshan, uh, uh, the, the Martian uh, uh, gravity uh, just before this encounter. So it was perfect. So both, uh, and especially for Maven, which was designed to study magnetic fields, extended atmospheres of Mars, and so on, it was the perfect 
uh, occasion to really uh, study uh, what, what might happen if, if Mars would interact with a comet. Uh, this was a picture taken uh, early on, 25th of September, very shortly after the, the Indian mission uh, entered Mars. And you can see the, the atmosphere there. Uh, the Mars has a magnetosphere. It's a, it's a little bit different magnetosphere than on Earth. It's Earth has, it doesn't have a dipole, but it has weak uh, uh, magnetic areas on Mars itself, and, and the solar wind uh, creates sort of an induced uh, magnetotail. And uh, there was a, a, a big interest in studying what the plasma of the comet would do to the, how it would behave in the magnetotail of Mars. And, uh, and so there's a lot of studies were focused on, on that. Uh, the, uh, the comet was uh, observed because of this close encounter. That that's, was nice as well. A lot of uh, s space assets were focused on it. And this comet is uh, really well observed. Uh, this is just a, a few uh, images, from s in this case, from Spitzer, Spitzer Space Telescope. The blue here is the, is the gas. <laughs> Uh, sort of a, a, you can see there's a gas coma around it, and the, the darker material is the dust, uh, small dust coins, the dust coma. Uh, so at this time was taken at 3 AU from the sun when CO2 gas was, was driving all the ejection. And then, of course, the comet was coming closer and closer. And uh, you know, the amateur astronomers got their teeth on it. <laughs> and so that resulted in a, a ton of really cool looking pictures. Um, especially because uh, the comet was seen against the backdrop of the Milky Way. And so uh, it passed uh, a bunch of interesting uh, astronomical objects, creating these really wonderful uh, opportunities to, uh, to get good images. The comet itself was not that bright, so uh, this, this was a challenge, but uh, the results have been quite spectacular. This is a picture taken by Tim Cooper, a friend of mine from the South Africa. He ran the, the South African Meteor Society for many years, ASA. And uh, he, he caught the comet uh, about an hour before it, its closest approach to Mars. So he had to put Mars outside the field of view to not completely overshadow uh, it. You can see there's a big uh, sort of a reflection from his telescope from Mars itself uh, that's hiding the comet. This is uh, a picture by Gerald Rehmann. It's one of the most beautiful I've, I've seen um, where uh, the comet is, is uh, well positioned relative to the diffraction spikes. And you can see, the, you can see it sit there. Uh, um, very, very close to Mars. Um, MAVEN, the MAVEN satellite, reported uh, uh, one observation so far, and that is that they did pick up the cloud of hydrogen atoms surrounding the uh, comet. Uh, the hydrogen comes from water molecules that are being uh, broken apart. And uh, the size of the cloud was uh, about 150,000 kilometers radius, which meant that uh, Mars would actually be showered with uh, hydrogen atoms, at least. So, uh, so, that, uh, so I think uh, this basically says that we have to look forward to uh, interesting, more interesting observations from the MAVEN spacecraft. Uh, we were a little bit worried uh, what was going on just before the encounter, because uh, until uh, the geometry conditions were uh, best, the uh, comet had been following the uh, expected light curve very nicely. <laughs> uh, it reached uh, just a little better than 10 magnitude uh, in brightness. Uh, but, then it, um, uh, but then it started dropping. And you can see just a few uh, 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 weeks before the encounter, you can see that, uh, uh, that the brightness d dropped a little bit below what, uh, about you know, two magnitudes below what it uh, was hoped for. So the comet was a little bit fainter than we had hoped, but it was still, you know, a very nice comet. It was clearly active, and the fact that the comet was a little less was maybe a good thing. This is a, a, an image that um, the uh, HST teams put together. It's a strange composite because they used a, a, a tracked image of the comet, removing the stars, with a, with a short exposure of Mars, and then used a Palomar Observatory Sky Survey star field plate <laughs> to uh, sort of align them all. And the, the, it looks all very weird. But um, w so what I did was I, I, I cheated and I brought up the, uh, uh, the contrast to really sort of look on the Hubble Space Telescope image, so how far did they pick up this, uh, this scattered sunlight um, from dust and gas. And you can see that uh, 
you know, this thing came, the, the, just the scatter light came almost halfway to the planet Mars. Uh, this is the view that uh, the Opportunity rover has come up with. Uh, they took 35 images uh, in the early morning hours. Uh, those are being carefully looked at. I'm hoping that uh, you know they they will find a streak somewhere. <laughs> um, unfortunately, there's a lot of little streaks in the images from cosmic rays and uh, various various sources. Um, but uh, this was the uh, this was our best chance to actually pick up meteors, and not necessarily from the comet, but but meteors in general from from Mars. And uh, this is sort of the brightness as you see the event on the, on the sky with the naked eye. So if you, if you would have been laying in your reclining lawn chair ready to go and see this, this meteor shower, uh, you could have spotted the comet in the sky. It was that bright. And this is an image that uh, was released by the QISM spect spectrometer on MRO. Uh, it's, a, it's basically a spectrometer that takes pictures in lots of different wavelengths, and so you can create all sorts of color graphs. Uh, this is a, so this is a color picture. You can see some shades of red and blue, which just means that you have different um, wavelength bands uh, being stronger than others. Um, this type of data is going to be looked at to, to, to understand what type of activity wa was there on the nucleus. Uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, I, of course, you know, played with this as well. I did a high-pass filter <laughs> to see what was really down there. And uh, you can see in the image to the... Uh, to the right, that there is actually sort of a tail visible of something that they picked up. So that will be cool. Uh, you can also see that there's a sort of a shadow sitting on the other side. I think that it's an artifact because this, the, uh, the pixel size here uh, is about a kilometer or so. Uh, what did I say? Four kilometers per pixel. So you're not going to see a nucleus. That said, <laughs> MRO high rise. Uh, took these images of the common nucleus, and they uh, really uh, zoomed in on the nucleus itself. And they saw this uh, it, at the top is really the center of their uh, observations. You can see that sort of a central uh, area, about three pixels in size. Uh, and the, the news st story that went out was that the comet was there for only three pixels, or about uh, 300 or 400 meters in size instead of the 800 meters. So the comet was actually smaller than we thought. But I think that's a little premature, <laughs> because I'm not convinced that that is the comet nucleus. I remember all too well uh, the comet Halley encounter, when everybody got really excited about a big bright blob. And what that bright blob was, was the formation of a meteoroid stream that was not a comet nucleus. The comet nucleus sat in the background as a really dark object, which we now know as comet Halley. And uh, that big wide uh, area was just an active region it's where a lot of dust uh, came off that scattered sunlight. Now, uh, you know, I played my little trick with throwing a high pass filter through this image as well. And you see the shadow pop up again. I'm sure that sh that is an artifact of my uh, being naive about image processing it. But uh, this is just, you know, to whet your appetite. I'm hoping that the MRO teams will go in, will very carefully analyze this data to see if they can pick up a shadow of the actual nucleus. That would, be, that would be very cool. So keep tuned. Uh, all of this uh, will come uh, uh, to light again when uh, uh, we have our meeting at the AGU in San Francisco. And uh, I really look forward to hear uh, what the science teams have to say. Thanks. <coughs>